Several years ago, when my researcher was going through the Boston Chronotype, which is a paper that Matthew contributed to in the 1840s, uh, she would just photograph whatever she intuitively felt looked like Matthew's work because he used a lot of different signatures. And one of the things she photographed was a poem called The Song of the Pumpkin. Now, I don't know if she recognized it. I certainly didn't. Turns out that it's a poem that's attributed to Matthew's brother, John Greenleaf Whittier, when it was published in 1850, copyright 1848, in uh, the poems of John Greenleaf Whittier, it was called The Pumpkin. And uh, I knew that that was Matthew's work immediately. Now, Matthew was a heavy contributor to the Boston Chronotype. He was close personal friends with Elijah Wright, but Elijah Wright was friends with both of the Whittier brothers, Matthew and John Greenleaf. Uh, they were all three of them heavily involved in the abolitionist movement at that time. And uh, it's just assumed that John Greenleaf was visiting Elijah Wright. Well, either Matthew was or both brothers were uh, having dinner with Elijah Wright uh, for Thanksgiving. So Matthew, as you know, if you've watched any of these blogs, Matthew's nickname, as I've determined, was Peter Pumpkin because he loved pumpkin pie. And because he was so mischievous and energetic that they used to say of him that he was some pumpkins. So uh, he would sign with all kinds of variations of that name. Um, I think there's 19 variations that I picked, picked out over the years. And then he would sign PP on occasion as well for Peter Pumpkin. He signed as Peter Pendergrass and Paul Pickle and all sorts of things like that. Not that he was the only one that did that, but I mean, 19 instances, it's pretty clear, you know, that it was a particular thing for him. So uh, it's quite reasonable that he would have had dinner with Elijah Wright, that um, he would have raved about the pumpkin pie, that Mrs. Wright would have given him one to take home, and that he would have written a poem thanking her for it, which is what this is, a thank you poem. So uh, recently, I kind of got online and started looking for people to tell this to. Of course, I know I'm going to be laughed at, you know, but you have to somehow or other, you have to break the ice. You have to introduce people to something, even if they're going to be incredulous. You know, they have to see it at least once anyway, you know. So I just assume that it's part of the you know cost of doing business that I'm going to be ridiculed the first two or three times anybody ever sees these things. But anyway, uh, there's an awful lot of instances of the pumpkin online. It's quite a famous poem. It's one of John Greenleaf Whittier's most famous poems, turns out. Well, it wasn't his poem. It ended up in a compilation, again, published in 1850, copyrighted 1848, called The Poems of John Greenleaf Whittier. I don't know how it got in there, but I'm assuming a lot of times somebody would hear something about Matthew and they would hear the name Whittier. So if it was a poem and it had the name Whittier on it, by the time it went through two or three tellings, you know, the way gossip develops, by the time it went through two or three tellings, only the name Whittier was attached to it, not Matthew. And it was assumed that it was John Greenleaf Whittier because who else would it possibly be? You know, it couldn't be his brother, you know. I mean, at this time, he wasn't even known as the author of Ethan Spike, no less any poems. So somehow or other, Word got to the people that were compiling this volume that Whittier had written this poem about a pumpkin, and they shortened the name to the pumpkin, and they included it in the compilation. Now, what I wanted to show you was that by the time uh, we get to 1857, when there's a reprint of this, John Greenleaf Whittier provides a kind of a, a, kind of a confession or a caveat but he's very vague about it. And uh, I think this is what he means by it. So I'm going to read it. In these, this is note by the author to the edition of 1857. I'm reading from the 1881 edition. In these volumes, for the first time, a complete collection of my poetical writings has been made. That's as of, you know, 1850. While it is satisfactory to know that these scattered children of my brain have found a home, I cannot but regret that I have been unable, by reason of illness, to give that attention to their revision and arrangement, which respect for the opinions of others and my own afterthought and experience demand. In other words, somebody else put this together. He was too sick to do it. See? 
Then he says that there are pieces in this collection which I would, quote, willingly let die, I am free to confess, but it is now too late to disown them, and I must submit to the inevitable penalty of poetical as well as other sins. There are others intimately connected with the author's life and times which owe their tenacity of vitality to the circumstances under which they were written and the events by which they were suggested. So, and then he goes on a little bit about Mog Magog, but if you read between the lines on that, you could take it to mean that he's saying that I wasn't supervising this book closely enough and the people that put it together put in one that was actually by my brother and wasn't mine, but it's too late to do anything about it. Matthew probably said, let it go, you know. So uh, what I'm going to do is to show you poems that Matthew Franklin Whittier wrote, which are very similar. I looked through this book and, you know, the other poems aren't in this style, near as I can tell. Now, there may be some that are in the same meter and so on, because I'm not familiar with all of John Greenleaf Whittier's literary and poetic legacy. But in this book, just scanning through it, I'm not seeing anything similar to this. But it's right down the line, the same style as several that Matthew had written. And we're going to go through those, or we're going to go through the first one completely. I'm going to read it completely. And the others I'll just read into a little bit to give you an idea. And what we're going to do, because there's a tendency, I think, of people to just watch a portion of these videos, my inclination would be to save the best for last. I like to do that. I did that in my videos when I was a video producer. But under the circumstances, I'm going to lead right out with the best one, you know. But first, let's compare the version that was originally published in the Boston Chronotype. This is the October 1st, 1846 edition. This is two years before John Greenleaf Whittier's book was copywritten and four years before it was published. I don't know what the lag was about. So what we're going to do is compare these, and um, I'm going to read from both of them a little bit. I'm going to start with John Greenleaf Whittier's version for a particular reason, because there's a difference. Right up at, at the beginning, there's a big difference. First line. So the pumpkin, it's called here, and he says, Oh, greenly and fair in the lands of the sun, the vines of the gourd and the rich melon run, and the rock and the tree and the cottage and fold with broad leaves, all greenness and blossoms, all gold. Now, this is the original version. It was called Song of the Pumpkin, and in brackets, written on receiving the gift of a pumpkin pie. You'll see everywhere pumpkin pie is written in this poem, both words are spelled in caps, initial caps. That's not the case in the version that was printed in 1850. And the signature is by a Yankee. Now, John Greenleaf Whittier did not use pseudonyms. There's one other claimed instance where he used a pseudonym. I forget what it is now. I'm kind of suspicious about that one. But he always signed with his initials or his name. That's because he wanted to be known. See, Matthew wanted to hide, and John Greenleaf Whittier wanted to be famous. So the people that want to be famous always sign either with their name or with a pseudonym that everybody knows, like Mark Twain. The people that want to hide use pseudonyms that nobody will ever figure out, except, of course, if he reincarnates, as Matthew did. But the first line in this one is, Oh, queenly and fair in the lands of the sun, not greenly. Okay? Oh, greenly makes no sense. You know, I mean, really, because the pumpkin is not green, and we are talking about vi vines and so on, but, you know, queenly and fair in the lands of the sun is was the original okay there was no reason to revise it to greenly <laughs> so i don't know who did the revision whether that was the people that put the book together or john greenleaf whittier himself you see that i'm trying desperately to cut him slack to avoid charging him with plagiarism because i really don't think he would stoop to that he wouldn't stoop to I mean, Matthew might hand it over to him and say, here, you're welcome to publish this, you know, because Matthew was very gracious about such things, especially with his brother. But it doesn't make sense that John Greenleaf would accept such an offer. You know, even if Matthew offered, he wouldn't plagiarize his own brother. So I don't know who changed Queenly into Greenly, but it's not an improvement at all. So what I'm going to do is to go ahead and read this entire poem as it was printed in the Boston Chronotype on October 1st, 1846, 
and uh, you can see what it sounds like. You may have heard this before. It's not substantially different except for that first line, but we might as well know what we're talking about here. And I'll mention here that at the very least, if I present this discovery to scholars, at the very least, they need to change the attribution to say, first published in the Boston Chronotype, October 1st, 1846, signed with the pseudonym by a Yankee, you know, and, and with the title Song of the Pumpkin. In other words, this has to be revised if scholars are going to be scholarly and ethical. Okay, if they don't, if they refuse to do it, that's not professional on their part. Okay, now, now that I've done castigating these people, because I'm still furious with them, because they're not rational. They, they climb onto the high ground of rationality, like the skeptics of the paranormal, and they pretend to be rational, and they are not. Okay. <laughs> All right, here we go. Oh, queenly and fair, and, I, and excuse me, and I'm not going to interpret any of the things in here. Some of them might have to look up. There's a lot of references, and Matthew would put classical references and literary references into his work as he was, he was very well read, but um, I'm not going to try to ferret them out here. Oh, queenly and fair in the lands of the sun, the vines of the gourd and the rich melon run, and the rock and the tree and the cottage enfold with broad leaves, all greenness and blossoms, all gold, like that which o'er Nineveh's prophet once grew, while he waited to know that his warning was true and longed for the storm cloud and listened in vain for the rush of the whirlwind and red fire rain. On the banks of the Zeno, the dark Spanish maiden comes up with the fruit of the tangled vine laden and the Creole of Cuba laughs out to behold through orange leaves shining the broad spheres of gold. Yet with dearer delight from his home in the north on the fields of his harvest, the Yankee looks forth where the crook necks are coiling and yellow fruit shines and the sun of September melts down on his vines. Ah, on Thanksgiving day, when from east and from west, from north and from south come the pilgrim and guest, when the gray-haired New Englander sees round his board the old broken links of affection restored, when the care-wearied man seeks his mother once more, and the worn matron smiles where the girl smiled before, what moistens the lip and what brightens the eye? What calls back the past like the rich pumpkin pie? Oh, fruit loved of boyhood, the old days recalling, when wood grapes were purpling and brown nuts were falling, when wild, ugly faces we carved in its skin, glaring out through the dark with a candle within, when we laughed round the corn heap with hearts all in tune, our chair a broad pumpkin, our lantern the moon, telling tales of the fairy who traveled like steam in a pumpkin shell coach with two rats for her team. Then thanks for thy present, none sweeter or better e'er smoked from an oven or circled a platter. Fairer hands ne'er wrought at a pastry more fine, brighter eyes never watched o'er its baking than thine. And the prayer which my mouth is too full to express swells my heart that thy shadow may never be less that the days of thy lot may be lengthened below, and the fame of thy worth like a pumpkin vine grow, and thy life be as sweet, and its last sunset sky golden tinted and fair as thy own pumpkin pie. That is Matthew Franklin Whittier. And once again, if you know who's writing to you, and if you're familiar with his other works, it comes alive for you more than if you think it was John Greenleaf Whittier. Now, for those of you who can't watch a whole video, we're going to go to our absolutely best example for comparison. I have to give a little background on it. This is early in the career of the Boston Weekly Museum, which was launched in mid-1848. Matthew started writing for this paper right away, the first edition, under a bunch of different pseudonyms. I'm absolutely certain of Matthew's authorship of these pieces. I can't go into how I determined that. But very early on, he established a pseudonym named Joe. And the way he did that is one of his other pseudonyms tells a story. And at the end, the person supposedly had died and Joe picks up the tale, you know, and, and translates or something. I, I can't remember exactly how it goes, but it's clearly the same person. So Matthew was establishing this new pseudonym as Joe. And a little later on, 
In the October 28, 1848 edition of the Weekly Museum, Joe provides a poem. Now, so much of Matthew's work is veiled autobiography. And uh, I have determined that Matthew must have proposed to Abby finally after years of them being kept apart. He finally, he couldn't, he couldn't figure out a way to become successful as a merchant. He tried and tried and tried, and he really wasn't cut out for it. And, uh, you know, because her father was a marquee and she was upper class and he was trying to be successful so that he could ask for her hand in marriage. Well, he finally gave up and just asked her. I think that they took a walk and ended up at, under moonlight, probably May 1st. And it was, it was moonlit, uh, full moon, May 1st, 1836. And he proposed to her on the banks of the Merrimack River there in uh, East Haverhill. Well, this apparently is a poem that's kind of loosely based on that experience. And I'm going to read it in its entirety. But first, so it's fresh in your mind, let's go back to the poem we just read. And I'm going to read one stanza of it. I just want you to try to keep in mind the meter and the, and the vibe of this poem. Oh, queenly and fair in the lands of the sun, the vines of the gourd and the rich melon run and the rock and the tree and the cottage and fold with broad leaves all greenness and blossoms all gold. Okay, you got it in your head now? Da 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 right? Okay, now we're gonna go to Joe, which is to say an interesting inquiry by Joe. And this is a long poem. It's it's an excellent poem. I mean Let's face it, people in 2022 have just got to develop a little bit of, you know, an ability to, to focus and concentrate for an extended period. You know, we just have to get that back. Did you ever, kind friend, of a midsummer's night, when the full harvest moon shone forth clearly and bright, and the sun his head laid on the rich, gorgeous breast of a bright western cloud had sunk slowly to rest, and the moon had her face with a fleecy cloud wiped when nightingales chorused and big bullfrogs piped and the bright borealis her gleams had set forth and balanced and chassied across the blue north and giddily o'er the empyrean danced while crickets chirped faintly and fireflies glanced and the water bugs buzzing arose from the brook and each constellation his wonted place took in the star-spangled firmament glowing above while musical cats warbled soft lays of love, and all nature seemed hushed in the depths of repose, like a sleeping doorbug in a large cabbage rose. Did you ever, I say, on a night like to this, sally forth for a walk with some beautiful miss, that is, some particular fair one, I mean, in your eyes the most lovely that ever was seen, some maiden whom you'd give your eye teeth to woo, whom you think about, dream of, and write verses to, whose image now haunts you in action grotesque, peeps from under the ledger or over the desk, makes you err in your footings, miscalculate bills, and your poor helpless mind with queer fantasies fills, makes you sign business letters, Sophia or Sue, and perpetrate all those absurdities too, which weak, lovesick youths are so apt to commit. In short, makes your brain for the least thing unfit, did you err, I repeat, for the third time at least, while you suffered your eyes on her beauties to feast, resolved as you traversed the side of a ditch, your courage screwed up to the highest safe pitch, that in one short moment your fate you would know, and learn from those fair lips your weal or your woe? Did you err, I say, for the last time, I declare, as you gan for your terrific task to prepare, and collecting your energies came to a stop? Resolved the momentous inquiry to pop, and screwing your face twixt a sneeze and a pout, when just as you blundered your love story out, feeling, looking, and acting as green as can be, and gracefully backing to fall on your knee, while the feeling of love seemed your senses to fuddle, step slap on a toad and fall splash in a puddle, stain your visage with filth, your proboscis with blood, and your hat in the gutter, your cane in the mud, and more than all this, to behold on that face, where lately you saw every possible grace on those lips where you hoped love's rich drafts to quaff, first a smile, then a giggle, and lastly a laugh, which no sense of propriety e'er could keep down. 
No good breeding stifle or etiquette frown into decent observance of usual rules, but maintained their position as stiffly as mules. If in such a position you e'er chance to be, you can sympathize then, gentle reader, with me. Exactly on target in every possible way you can think of, you know. That's Matthew Franklin Whittier. That was him in 1848. We just heard from him in 1846. It's only two years apart. So uh, now, if you're the kind that gets bored with too long a video, you can leave. But we've got a couple more examples. I won't necessarily read all of these. Let's start with some that I have physical copies of. This one is one of Matthew's best humorous poems, in my opinion. I'm going for the reprint that's in the Philadelphia album. And uh, I got to bring my light down. The type is small in this. And this is about a girl of 16 who writes to her father about a very unwise choice that she has made, you know. But it's already too late because uh, she's already married this guy by the time the letter gets to her father. See, it's absolutely a scream. But it's, it's pretty similar in its construction. So this is called From Isabel Flitz Asking Consent. I told you, dear Pa, in my last, oh no, I believe I did not. The thing which one sits down to write is the very thing I always forgot. But now I will tell. And perhaps that I did not before is as well, for until we decided, you know, there was nothing as special to tell. And tis only a month or six weeks, t'was the night which I wrote you about, when we walked by the silvery beach. Was that walk from my letter left out? Oh, then I have got to go back. You'll excuse me, I hope, for the slips of my pen. When a body is confused, the pen stammers just like the lips. Well, the party that went out with us had left us alone on the shore. I wonder they were in such haste. T'was a trick never played us before. And we stood on the bank and looked down in silence, long, long on the sea. I mean that I did. His dear eyes were fixed all the while upon me. Oh, I thrilled with a feeling all new. For the beam of the look which he gave sunk deep in my soul as the glance of the moon through the luminous wave. And he vowed by the stars that have shone on the sky from the hour of their birth, by the sea that's so true to the moon, and the moon that's so true to the earth. He adored, and he said, "'Twas all false, the story of Clarissa Lee. I knew so before, though I'd wept, how mischievous people can be. Your money, he said, was to him as the dew to the fathomless tide. I've heard his own went like the dew, but the tattlers undoubtedly lied. For he spoke of his owning a mill." connected with which is a bank, the one manufacturing cash, the other for issuing plank. And he spoke of the buggy he keeps and his farm where he frequently calls, somewhere out in the state of New York on his route to Niagara Falls. I knew this would gratify you, and so I consented, or rather I promised to write for consent, which you won't refuse, will you, dear father? They'd fill your head full of their tales, but he swears they are false if his name, what a beautiful name for a man, is Augustus Frederick Graham. The school is most out, and I'm sure I'm old enough now to engage. You'd hate an old maid, and he says sixteen is the prettiest age. So you won't be vexed, will you? Now don't. I wish you could come to our when, but I'll bring him home soon from the jaunt, and I know you'll be satisfied then. And now, while I think, dearest Pa, Please send by the very first mail. He's momently looking for funds, but says they may possibly fail. Some five hundred dollars you must. I need it for trinkets and things, and your letter to Isabel Graham will find us at Lebanon Springs. <laughs> She's already married to this huckster, see. <laughs> uh, so that's one pretty similar style. You can see his cleverness and his originality here. And the other one I have a physical of is much more serious in tone. This was written after Abby's death. Um, that last one was in 1830. This is 1844, after about three years after Abby had died. It's a tribute poem. He's comparing her to a lyre, the musical instrument, and saying the uh, describing the phases that she went through. 
the first phase being as a child, the second as a married woman, and the third in heaven. This is signed with a star, which is Matthew's secret go-to signature. He used it in the material in the New York Tribune that people think was written by Margaret Fuller, but he used it as early as 1829 and as late as 1873. All through his career, he used this pseudonym. The spirit lyre, t'was morn to earth's fair child, the morn of life, the spirit lyre with joyous strains was rife. They knew it by the quick and graceful mien. They knew it by the eyes full gladsome beam, by that exuberance of happiness which only youth's first hours can ever possess. Time passed, the lyre sent forth a deeper tone. With higher pleasure was her pathway strown. Love's altar now had found itself a place within her soul and gave to every grace an added charm. Soon Hyman's chain had bound, and Zephyr's still all lightly played around. Hyman here is a god, god of marriage. But deeper, richer, more melodious still, the harmony did all her spirit fill. A purer, holier light was in the glance, and shed its glory o'er the countenance. A peace like that which dwells upon the breast of silent waters, where the day beams rest. In mute farewell and life, so bright before was happier still for now religion o'er its every scene a holy radiance cast and when the storm of life arrived at last for none however bright their lot are free the liar discoursed of immortality signed with a star it's not exactly the same meter but uh, it's similar and it's same sensibility the same creativity this is an excellent poet this unknown now, uh, let's see, we've got one more. This is signed PP, and I've said that Matthew would sign as PP or, or uh, Peter Pendergrass or Peter Pumple or any number of Peter Pumpkin derivatives. This is signed PP, and this is a very early one. This is June 29, 1827 from the New England Galaxy. So Matthew is... 15 years old, almost 16 years old at this time, 15 years old, okay? And this is, it's got a double meaning. Supposedly, it's written to his cousin Dick at Buxton. Well, he did actually have a cousin, Richard, in Methuen, Massachusetts, but I think he changed the name of the town to hide the, his cousin's identity. And the ostensible meaning of this, the surface meaning, and Matthew would have layers, is that he's uh, gotten a job making cabinets. Well, he may indeed have gotten one there in Boston. When he had run away from home and he was living in Boston, he may have been for a while making cabinets. But um, underneath that is all kinds of references that has to do with, uh, it's a publication called The Cabinet that uh, Robert Southey apparently had some um, involvement with. And, uh, you know, again, I'm not going to go into all the references because this is something I, I only have the Internet for these things. I don't remember them by past life memory, and I'm not a scholar, so I haven't studied them for the last 30 or 40 years. You know, what I, what I have is the Internet, and I have to look these things up, which I did for my book. One of them, I still don't know what it means. I'll get into this a little ways, maybe. I don't know. I want to read the whole thing, but it's pretty long, so. You ask me, dear Dick, what we're doing in town. Though for ten that are doing, there's seven done brown. I think that means drunk. But doing or done, we are all of us taking a wonderful interest in cabinet making. You have heard, I suppose, that among the odd things which belong to the best of old England's good kings was a curious old cabinet formed of the wood that, in George III's time, was pronounced to be good, prime, well-seasoned stuff, and made up in the form prescribed by the pilot who weathered the storm. "'Twas costly enough, though was not very showy. "'Would you know what it cost us? "'Ask Aberdeen Joey.'" I don't know what that means. If anybody knows what it means and wants to put it in the comments, I'd appreciate that. I don't know what he means by Aberdeen Joey. But cost what it might, it was the pride of the king, and loud in its praise Bobby Southey would sing, until some years ago, by a shocking event, there was one of its panels away from it rent, and the new stuff they used to repair this disaster only pushed on its whole dissolution the faster. T'wasn't properly seasoned, and took a strange twist, and the framework too cranky, that twist to resist. The joints all got loosened, the old panels cracked, the locks, although patent, no longer would act. 
and the doors then would neither stand open nor shut, no matter what treasure they into it put. So at last, having spoiled, sir, the old one, the true one, Mr. Canning was ordered to make us a new one. You know Mr. C. is remarkably clever. Such a workman as he, the old world, saw never. Be the job what it may be is equally handy, for at turning his hand he's a true jack-a-dandy. So going to work without further delay, he knocked the old cabinet up in one day. But it took him three weeks, and a great deal of bother, to find stuff sufficient to make us another. And now it is finished, they say it's an oddity, a sort of a kind of a hotchpotch commodity. And I wanted to read to that point, because doesn't that sound like Dr. Seuss? <laughs> this, I believe, is what's called a doggerel. Well, so, you know, if Dr. Seuss wrote in doggerel style, you know, okay, well, there might not be any connection there. They just both picked up the doggerel style. But that one line, there's a line in Dr. Seuss, I forget where it is now. I think it's, if I ran the zoo or McGilligot's pool or one of those that I was familiar with, a sort of a kind of a hodgepodge commodity. It sounds like it's right out of Dr. Seuss. So anyway, that's all the examples that I had. I could, I could pull out a lot more if I wanted to, but I wanted to try to keep this short. We're under half an hour. But again, I want to say that if the scholars want to be scholarly, if they want to be precise, if they want to be professional, I have found something that they need to change the record for. And oh, are they reluctant to change the record, no matter how good your evidence is. But this is in your face obvious. You know, in the Boston Chronotype, October 1st, 1846, you can look it up, you can hold it in your hands, you can see that it's the original of this poem. It was not signed John Greenleaf Whittier. It did not have that title. It had the word queenly in the first line instead of greenly, and that needs to be changed. Now, whether you attribute it to Matthew Franklin Whittier or not, that would depend on all the other research I've done, because what I've shared with you here is just an indication. It's not all the evidence. For one thing, you know, Matthew apparently was so such close friends with Elijah Wright that when he was on his way to do abolitionist undercover work, in the South, in New Orleans, Elijah Wright was addressing him as Cher, which in French is a term of endearment, you know, darling. Okay, so Elijah Wright was calling him Cher. That's how close they were. And in 1847, there's like almost every day or every other day, Matthew was writing from New York City to Elijah Wright as XFW instead of MFW. And they were getting printed like every day in the Boston Chronotype for a year or every other day or every third day or whatever. But there's a whole bunch of them. Um, so they kept in very close contact and were very close friends. But technically, it's difficult to prove 100% to any scholar that XFW was really MFW. Um, but it was. And likewise, Cher, I know that was him because looking at the whole picture, I can see that Matthew was going by steamboat on his way from a anti-slavery convention up probably in Cincinnati or somewhere. He was going by steamboat boat down to New Orleans. See, uh, you know, I mean, not I don't know if he could go the whole way or not. I think so. But at any rate, he was writing a Cher on that trip. See, and then he starts writing um, I, I, if it was 1846. He starts writing as F, signing with his middle initial F. If it was 1847, I can't remember which it was, then he was not signing those pieces. But it was Matthew Franklin Whittier writing the police office arraignment hearings in New Orleans in the summer of 1846 and the summer of 1847. And I can prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. So there's a vast, again, a vast tapestry that I have as my evidence that says that Matthew and Elijah Wright were very close. So, um, you know, they may not want to put Matthew Franklin Whittier's name on there in place of his brother's name, but at the very least, I mean, if they respected me, they would, because I'm the world expert on this subject. Uh, Larry Glatz, notwithstanding, I'm the world expert on Matthew Franklin Whittier and his works. I've studied him for 13 years, and I'm his reincarnation, and I have intuitive past life emotional memory, which helps guide me like radar, you know. And uh, I'm absolutely certain that this is Matthew's poem. So if they respected me, they would change the name and change it to Matthew Franklin Whittier. 
given that they don't respect me at the very least if they want to be professional not to beat a dead horse here but they need to change you know when it first appeared the name it was published under they need to include the fact that john greenleaf whittier didn't use pseudonyms and uh, they need to give the real title and they need to uh, give the correct first line because let's give john greenleaf whittier some credit he would not have changed queenly to greenly <laughs> okay and uh, that's all we have for today.